You asked me to put uh, this transparency. In particular, I'd like to thank Shraddha Sharma, Rebecca Krause, and Andreas. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, and also, thanks to Giovanna's collaborators. Uh, in particular, I'd like to mention Shmuel Fishman, who passed away this year. Shmuel was a great theoretician, who worked at the Technion. Um, Okay, so um, so so what I'd like to tell you about today um, is about actually three experiments that we recently done uh, in our group of cations at the Weizmann Institute. All have to do with uh, dynamic and spectral control of cation crystals. This is a uh, a many body ion workshop, so I promise not to show any experiment that uses a single ion. All these experiments would use two ions and more. Um, all these experiments were not done by me, but rather by a group of hardworking and talented PhD students whose names are here, and I'll mention people who led different experiments as, as we go on. So the three, three experiments um, I'd like to describe. Um, the first one is the realization of robust entanglement gates. We all use entanglement gates, or many of us. These entanglement gates more and more and more. These gates are susceptible to errors. And what I'd like to describe is the design and implementation of uh, entanglement gates that are robust against, against various errors. The second experiment I'd like to discuss is how we are able to take long ion strings, which suffer from inhomogeneous quadruple shifts, if you're trying to drive transitions that have quadruple shifts. And I'd like to describe a dynamic decoupling technique that gets rid, gets rid of this. Um, these um, uh, quadruple shifts. And last, I'd like to describe a way, uh, an experiment in which we use an entangled state in order to perform precision measurement of uh, bisphere shifts. So the first experiment uh, is that of robust entanglement gates. This, this experiment was led by Yotam Shapira. Actually, also the ideas that I presented here were uh, ideas that Yotam came up with during his master's thesis, which I think is a remarkable, uh, remarkable achievement for a young scientist. Okay, so uh, I think that the, the main workhorse of trapped ion quantum computing in terms of entangling ions in a quantum register is the molmer sorensen gate. And in the molmer sorensen gate, the variation of the molmer sorensen gate we implemented in our lab uses an optical transition between a ground S state and an optically excited D orbital uh, of strontium plus. Uh, and the, I think the first experiments of implementing the molmer sorensen in optical transition were done, uh, were done in Innsbruck. Other groups have used uh, other types of qubits, microwave, uh, Zeeman qubits, in order to drive the molmer sorensen interaction. In short, uh, what you do is you use a two-tone, so bi-frequency uh, field that connects the two qubit levels, and it's slightly off resonance from the red and blue sidebands of a singly excited uh, ion, where the two-ion transition, so the, in our case, the SS to DD, is on resonance, and when you do that, uh, this is uh, data from our lab, uh, after about 150 microseconds, we could prepare a coherent superposition of the, uh, the two ions being the SS and the DD states. Now, the molar sorensen gates are, are great. We perform them with a fidelity somewhere between 98 and 99%. The best that was demonstrated so far is a, a 3.9 uh, fidelity. They're very good, but they are susceptible to errors. So if you have imperfections in different parameters, uh, in your gate drive, you're going to suffer from errors. And these examples for such parameters are the gate time, the trap frequency, the laser detuning, carrier coupling, uh, and so on. So what we set up to do is to try and find a way to mitigate uh, uh, these errors, to robustify the gates. So again, uh, the molmer sorensen uses a bichromatic field where there's a, 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 a carrier transition, that a frequency that couples the the S to D transition, but then you add up two sidebands, the plus and the minus here refers to the two sidebands. They're almost resonant with a, with a, a motional sideband. The frequency of that motion is new, and it's offset by some detuning, some gate detuning, uh, psi naught from this transition. The sum of these two frequencies, again, matches the transition from the SS to the DD. Now, it turns out that you can actually write the time evolution of uh, the ions during the gate. And what you get is a time evolution operator that looks like this. Uh, you have uh, a displacement both in momentum and in position. This pl displacement is spin dependent. JY is the total spin of the two ions, sum of the Pauli Y of one and the Pauli Y of two. 
which means that as a function of time, your ion is gonna, your ions are going to go through phase space. This is the x and the p direction of the phase space. Uh, in some trajectory, and the trajectory would be parameterized by these functions g of t and f of t. Okay. Now, in addition to this, uh, you're going to have uh, a phase acquired by the two ions, and the phase would depend on the collective spin states of the two ions. So what are the requirements for this drive to be a valid gate, for the gate to be successful? What you want is at the end of the gate, when the time equals t, the, the gate time, for motion to be disentangled from spin, and that means that this trajectory has come full circle back to where you started it from. And the phase that you acquired, which is proportional to the area that you're encircled in phase space, has to be equal to pi over 2 for you to be able to entangle the ions. If these two criteria are met, then if you start in both ions in the S state and you apply this gate, you get your entangled, your entangled superposition. Okay, so how can we take this gate and generalize it to a family of gates and add more degrees of freedom to the problem? The way you do it is by adding, or one way to do it is by adding more frequency tones to your grade to write. So instead of having just a single detuning here, we add multiples of the detuning. N here is an integer number, and you'd like it to be an integer number in order for all these tones to end up at the zero motion at the end of the gate. Okay? So this allows you to generalize the gate to, to a family of gates, if you like. Um, there are some conditions that you can uh, give on the phase of these, of these different uh, tones. So these different tones have amplitudes. These amplitudes are complex numbers. You can play with their magnitude, the size of this R. You can play with the phase. You can constrain the phase in various ways, which I'm not going to go into. But the important part here is this, this, this would still be a valid gate if two conditions are met. One condition is that psi naught is, is indeed uh, 1 over the gate time. So this is the tuning, you know, the original tuning we're, we're used to from the original one sort of gate. And the other condition is that the sum over the ri squared, the condition over the geometric phase that you acquired is quadratic in the amplitude. So the sum of ri squared over ni equals 1. As long as these two conditions are met, you still have a valid gate. Um, and here is an example. So now we have a family of gates. They're all characterized by a series of ends, so the tones that you choose to use. Each of the tones is associated with an amplitude. And here are examples for three different gates. This is the n equal 1 is the original Walmer Sorensen gate. This, this is the circle here. But I can also drive a, a two-tone gate where instead of a single off-resonance frequency away from the side, then I have two of those. In this case, it's n equal one, n equal two, and I get this heart-shaped trajectory here, and I can play with a three-tone gate and get this funky green, green shape. All of these are valid gates and will entangle your ions just the same. Turns out that if you write the time evolution operator, again, it'll look very similar. You'll have a, a spin displacement, so a momentum spin-dependent momentum displacement, spin-dependent uh, position-dependent spin -dependent position displacement, both are, are parameterized by functions g of t and f of t, and a geometric phase, uh, which is parameterized by the function a of t. Now that we have more degrees of freedom, we can try and use these degree of freedom. We have redundancy, so we can design these degree of freedom in order to robustify the gate. How do we do that? We can write, uh, find an analytic expression for the gate fidelity, um, uh, and it looks like this. So this is the gate fidelity after we finished running the gate. You can see that um, you know, the gate fidelity depends on f and g being 0 here, and a equals uh, um, pi over 2. In this case, this sum function would be 1. If f and g are equal 0, then these two exponents are 1. Um, and in this case, we get, uh, we get a fidelity. So if we sum the fractions here, we get a fidelity of 1. You'll notice the temperature here does not, as long as you're in the lambda Dicke regime, does not hurt your fidelity. But if your parameters are wrong, uh, not being in the ground state certainly amplifies your error. So temperature in the lambda Dicke regime does not cause error in itself. It amplifies errors if they do exist. At least, for example, timing errors. What we can do now is take this fidelity, expand it order by order in different parameters of the gate drive. So for example, the gate time, Chap frequency, any parameter you'd like, you can expand this fidelity order by order, and now play with these extra degrees of freedom we have in order to kill these or these these errors order by order. 
Here is an example. What happens if you have an error in the gate timing? That means that instead of driving the correct time, you have some delta t. Turns out that the error you get goes as delta t over t to the power of 2n, where n is the number of tones you use. If you have the regular molmer sorensen gate, n equals 1, that means your error is quadratic in, in the time error that you have. If you use a two-tone gate, the error would, be, uh, would go like the time to the fourth time, which is a, a, better, a better gate. So for the n equal 2 solution, turns out, for n equal 2, turns out that the gate solution that kills the second order timing error is a solution where the tone of the first, the, the amplitude of the first tone is equal minus the amplitude of the, of the second tone. This is the heart-shaped solution I've shown you before. This shape is called a cardioid. You get it by rolling a circle on top of another circle, and you get this, this nice heart-shaped heart solution. And when we use this solution and drive the gate, you can see that when we drive the regular molmer sorensen gate, the blue trajectory in phase space here, indeed the air, this is the population of the two ions. The red curve is the SS population, the blue curve, is, I'm sorry, the blue curve is the SS population, the red curve is the DD population, the yellow curve is the SD plus the S population. You see that errors in the gate time correspond to a quadratic error in the population you would like a 50%, 50% population at the gate time. And when we use the cardio, we get a much flatter response around the gate time. This is the fourth order response. Um, turns out that this cardio solution also kills carrier coupling uh, to the same level of, of uh, reduction. So here you see, again, a comparison between a molmer sorensen gate and a cardioid gate where on purpose we lower the trap frequency significantly, so offers on stereo coupling would be significant. What you see here is the SD plus DS population at the first 2% of the gate time. And you see that when you drive molmer sorensen you get 2% amplitude population, meaning you have off-resonance carrier coupling that takes your population to the D-level. This is an unwanted error. Whereas when we drive the cardioid gate, we cannot measure any. So the same solution gets rid of timing error as well as, as, well as uh, off-resonance carrier coupling. The next error we set up to uh, null using this method is that of trap frequency errors. So there's a trap in nu, the trap frequency, and that's why we term these gates nuoid gates. Uh, turns out that when you expand the error order by order, uh, you cannot get rid of the or altogether. You're always left with a second order error in the trap frequency, however, this second order coefficient can be minimized. It cannot be taken to zero, but it can be significantly minimized. What you can get rid of order by order is the purity of the state after the gate is done, which means that what you can actually kill by adding more tones to your gate drive is the skin motion entanglement that you get left at the end of the gate. So there would not be any, any entanglement to spin in motion, which means you still get a pure state at the end but you would not be able to optimize to optimize the phase to be pi over 2. So you'll still be left with a little bit of error. Uh, so this is data showing uh, the fidelity, so taken from both populations in parity, measurements of the gate. Uh, the molar Sorensen is the rate data here, simulation and data. You can see that you get second order um, error here around the correct trap frequency. By the way, you can see here that we scan the trap frequency uh, the error in the trap frequency to half the, the correct So the, uh, the, the trap frequency varies by half the molar source of the tuning from the, from the side map, which means you're almost, you're almost getting the side map. Uh, you can see that when we drive the, both the cardioid and the nuoid gate, this is the yellow data here and the blue data here, we get almost flat response. So we're much better in terms of dealing with trap errors using these gates. So what, what does the new oil gate look like? You showed us with the cardio. Uh, in phase space. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 can, yeah, I, I, can sh I can go to the paper and show you the trajectory. It's not too far in terms of its shape. Uh, both, by the way, you, you can see that um, both, so if you look at the cardioid solution, you can see that it's closer to the origin. You don't go as further out as from the origin as you do in the molmer sorensen And that's why the amplitude of these yellow oscillations here is lower than the amplitude of the yellow oscillation, oscillation here. And the more tones you get, you start 
closing trajectories which sometimes go around the origin several times, if you go less further away from the origin than you would in a regular time sense. All right. The next experiment I'd like to tell you about is that of uh, how to use dynamic cancellation of inhomogeneous electric quadruple shifts. Uh, yeah. Sorry, if we're related to these gates, the using more tones means only you use more laser power. Is this true? Or do you adjust That's it? That's true, or you, you lose you lose in time. So mm -hmm. there's a scaling you can you can write that tells you how But you're not limited by spontaneous emission, so this is In this case no. You're not limited by spontaneous emission. I mean, it's just because it's an optical, it's an optical clock transition. So. Okay, the second experiment I'd like to describe is that of using dynamic decoupling in order to kill quadrupole shifts uh, on trapped ions. In particular, it's important when you use trapped ion crystals and the quadrupole shift is inhomogeneous. This is an experiment, uh, the theory here as well as the experiment theory was developed and the experiment was performed mainly by Ravi Chaniv, who's now a postdoc uh, at Gila. And related work was actually published uh, very uh, close to, to our publication. This was a collaboration between Alex Letzkill's group who did the theory and Peter Schlitz. Okay, so what is the motivation? The motivation is, is uh, mainly coming from the world of optical clocks. A recent uh, demonstration, I think the, the most accurate, I don't, I'm not sure, maybe the aluminum clock is similar uh, accuracy these days. Uh, but it's better? Yeah. Okay, but this, this is an example of a comparison of two Etruvian clocks by the group of Eckhart Pike um, at the PTB, which was able to show an accuracy and, and statistical uncertainty of 3 times 10 to the minus 18, which means 1 second in 10 to the 10 years, age of the universe or so. The caveat here is because you use a single ion, I think that is true also in the case of comparing two aluminum ions, projection noise is, is a problem. And you need to average in order to get rid of projection noise. And in order to get to 10 to the minus 18, it requires 4,000 hours of average, which is a few months. You need to be very, very patient in order to get to the 10 to the minus 18 with a single ion. A straightforward solution is to use a crystal of 50 ions like the one we heard of from, uh, from Chris at the beginning of the conference. And since statistical noise would go down as the square root of n, you, you could get to the same statistical uncertainty hours, which, which would be great. The problem is that when you're using that many ions, you start getting inhomogeneous shifts. And two such inhomogeneous shifts would be due to the magnetic, possible magnetic field gradients across the chain, which would shift the, the resonance frequencies of the ions. Another possible systematic shift is that of electric field gradients, which are inherent to ion traps. That's how we trap our ions, by applying electrical gradients across them. If there is any quadruple moment to the states which are involved in the clock transition, this electrical gradient will shift the clock, the clock frequency. So instead of having 50 identical clocks, you'll have 50 different clocks. So can we use dynamic techniques in order to null uh, these shifts? And the answer is yes. So for example, one way to null the first order Zeeman shift is to apply echo pulses. And we apply these echo pulses not in between the two clock states, but inside the manifolds of either the ground or the excited states. What you see here is data that was taken inside a Ramsey experiment, where the first power of a 2 pulse initialized the clock, optical clock superposition. A second power of a 2 plus measured that clock superposition. But in between, we implemented a series of microwave pulses that flipped the state of the D level which is involved in the clock transition from a plus M level to a minus M level. In this case, the, suscept the magnetic susceptibility of the optical superposition reversed its sign. Now, it reversed its sign, but it had a different magnitude, which means your echo pulses has to be placed such that the waiting times are not the same in the two states. But if the ratio of waiting times is equal to the ratio of magnetic susceptibilities, you can get rid of the first order Zeeman effect. And what you see here is the Ramsey measurement that we get when we do that, we see that we kill magnetic field defasing and we're left with a Ramsey coherence time of about 10 milliseconds, which indicates that our laser alignment is about 15, 15 hertz. It's a, it's a bit tough or a bit more complicated to get rid of the, of the quadruple shift. So in the clock superposition, the ground state does not have any quadruple moment. It's perfectly symmetric. It does have a Zeeman splitting. 
The excited state does have a quadruple moment. It's not spherically symmetric. It also has a zeta component to it. So we would like to use a, a dynamic decoupling sequence that would kill the quadruple, the quadruple shift of the excited state. How would you do that? So the intuition behind the cancellation goes as follows. So if I look at the Hamiltonian of the D-level manifold of my clock transition, it has a Zeeman term here. It has the quadruple shift Hamiltonian. It's a tensor shift. And that's why it looks like some prefactor. This is the quadruple uh, moment of the D-level. And then J squared minus 3JZ squared. And that's a general way with which you can write tensor shifts of, of atomic states. And this is my control field. In this case, I choose a JY, uh, a JY Hamilton. This is my dynamic coupling field. This is something I, this is free evolution. This is my control. So it's easy to see that this control field would get rid of the Zeeman shift. Right? That is because JZ and JY do not commute. JY would flip JZ from JZ to minus JZ, JZ minus JZ. So these two would cancel each other. How about the quadruple shift? So to see what JY does to the quadruple shift, it, it would make sense to write, instead of JZ squared, write JZ squared <coughs> as JZ squared plus JX squared, and JZ squared minus JX squared. Now notice that JZ squared plus JX squared is J, J squared minus JY squared. That is because JX squared, JY squared, plus JZ squared squared, and J squared. Maybe that was a bit fast. But anyways, this is really J squared minus JY squared. And that is why this Hamiltonian here commutes with JY. Okay. But the difference Hamiltonian does not commute with JY. That means JY would kill this term. And I can now write JY squared minus 3JZ squared as simply J, J squared minus JZ squared plus JX squared. Okay. So... This is what I get after an evolution under JY. The JZ squared was, was gone, and I can write this term as this. And now, in order to cancel the quadruple shift, all I need to do is add some free evolution, turn off this JY squared. I'll, I'll remain with a little bit of JZ squared, and I'll remain with JY squared minus 3JZ squared. Now, if you look at the sum of these two, if the wait time was 2 thirds and third, I can sum these two and get j squared minus the sum of jx squared, jy squared, and jz squared, which is really zero. And this, this is the way I kill the quadruple shifts. So the experiment we did was run an optical Ramsey experiment without any cancellation to an optical, uh, to, a, to another clock transition investigation with cancellation. Two thirds of the time I apply my jy, one third of the time I do not, and I measure. Now, I want to kill the quadruple shift to the subhertz level, and the problem is I don't have subhertz resolution on my optical clock uh, transition. So in order to know that I'm actually doing what I'm hoping to do, um, instead of looking at the transition frequency of each of the ions, I'm comparing the transition frequency of the two ions. In other words, what we performed here was correlation spectroscopy. So if you perform a Ramsey experiment on two ions, these are the superpositions that we prepare. <coughs> But after Ramsey experiment, if we look, instead of looking at the probability of each of the ions being in the excited or ground state separately, I look at the correlation of both ions being in the even parity and odd parity states, I, I, I will actually get a signal which is proportional to the phase difference between the two ions. Okay? And the phase difference between the two ions is independent of the laser of the laser frequency. So I can perform, I can compare the oscillation frequency of the two ions with respect to each other with a resolution that is, that is subverts relatively easily. These are the uh, results of the experiment. So here we put three ions with a magnetic field gradient uh, put on them okay, on purpose. Now if there is no quadruple shift, the frequency difference between ion one and two and the frequency difference between ion two and three would be the same simply because the gradient is, is high in the air. However, in the presence of a quadruple shift, the frequency difference between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 would not be the same. This is what you see here. This is without any quadruple shift cancellation. When we apply the quadruple shift cancellation sequence, we see that uh, both, both uh, frequencies are the same. I still have a little bit of magnetic field gradient. This is because of the one-third time free evolution that I have. Um, but the quadruple shift has been canceled at the 10 millihertz level, which is at the 10 to the minus 7. 
systematic uncertainty, uh, systematic uncertainty, and this is mainly limited by our, our measurement, not, not, not by the principle. How much time do I have? Ten minutes? Okay. So, in order to, um, I'm, I'm going to briefly go over the rest of the quadruple shift, so I'll have a little bit of time to speak about isotope shifts and connect to the next talk, uh, Vladan. Um, if we would like to get rid of this little bit of Zeeman shifts, we can apply these echo pulses uh, in the remaining one-third time of free evolution. And when we do that, I'm not going to go in detail through the data. This is a comparison across uh, uh, an ion chain of seven ions. You can see the frequency difference between different pairs of ions is, is different. And we can use this data in order to extract the, the magnetic field gradient across the chain as well as the quadrupole shift. But if we apply the full cancellation sequence, which includes pulses that get rid of Zeeman shifts, we see that all the pairs have zero frequency difference for measurement. So these sequences are actually very useful, we believe, in order to interrogate, perform optical puck interrogations of multi crystals. The last topic I'd like to uh, talk about is a recent measurement we performed in which the isotope shift uh, was measured with very high precision using a two isotope entangled state. This work was led by Tom Anowitz and, and Sam Akerlein. And actually, 20 minutes ago, Tom sent me an email that was accepted to PRL. Anyway, so what are isotope shifts? Um, and here I'll give an introduction a little bit to what Vladan would be talking about. The isotope shift is an isotope dependent change of the electron energy levels. When you change the number of neutrons, you change the mass of the isotope we move from one, one isotope to another. And what are the leading order contributions to the isotope shift? Well, there are two dominant contributions to the isotope shift. One comes from the difference in mass between the different isotopes. So for example, the reduced mass when you solve the atomic uh, uh, spectrum, you look at the electron in, in, the, in the center of mass frame. The reduced mass in the center of mass frame depends on the mass of the nuclei. Okay, only a little bit, but it does. The second leading contribution is that of the, it's the field shift due to the fact that the, uh, the nucleus is not a point charge uh, a particle. It rather has a finite charge radius. And the uh, electronic wave function overlaps this uh, r equals 0 uh, nucleus. And that changes the energy uh, of the electron. Now, a spectroscopist by the name of uh, William King from the Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford in the 60s noticed that you could write these two contributions to a very good approximation in the following way. You can take, take any of these terms, both the mass shift and the field shift, and write them as a product of two contributions. One contribution only depends on the electronic wave function that, that you use, meaning it depends on the transition that you investigate. It does not depend on the isotope. For example, if you look at the field shift, then the F uh, prefactor here depends on the density of the electron on the nucleus. That, to a very good approximation, at least in first order approximation theory, does not depend on the mass of the nucleus. It only depends on the electronic wave function, on the transition used. Whereas the charge radius of, of, uh, of, uh, I, of, of the nucleus does not depend on the transition used. It only depends on the isotope that you use. And this factorization also holds to a very good approximation for the, for, the, uh, for the mass shift. And that means that if you now take this equation here and you divide by the difference in reduced masses, this is the dependence on the isotopes in the case of mass shift, you can write a normalized isotope shift as a sum of two electronic terms and only one term that depends, that depends on the nucleus. Okay? Now, if you take two such transitions, you can take this unknown quantity out and write one of these transition as a linear function of the other transition. And now if you plot these normalized isotope shifts with respect to each other along an isotope chain, you expect to see a highly linear relation. This is called the King plot. So in a collaboration with a, a, a group of high energy theorists at the Weizmann, we came up with a proposal that says that, look, what happens if you have a new force? If you have a new force, could be a scalar force that couples the electron to the nucleus, 
you'll have some interaction potential between the electron and the nucleus that would look like Hayukawa potential with a range that depends on the mass of this mediating boson. And in this case, you would have another term in the King relation that would bend, bend the King plot away from linearity. And in a later publication with uh, more collaborators, um, we're able to predict bounds that you could place on the existence of such new forces, such new physics, given an isotope shift comparison along an isotope chain of given different, different atomic species. Uh, among these are both neutrals as well as uh, ions. Ions are particularly uh, convenient for this measurement. With the data I'm showing here is a, a preliminary data coming from Michels. Uh, lab, and, and you'll hear soon about uh, other data that was taken in, in Vladan's group. Uh, here, linearity was, was confirmed at the sub-kilohertz level. Sub-kilohertz level, or even, even 100 hertz or so. So even the kilohertz level on top of a gigahertz isotope shift, that means this line is linear at the minus line 6. So we want to measure isotope shifts very accurately. Um, and how would you do that? We've measured the isotope shift between strontium-88 and strontium-86. It's a 570 megahertz isotope shift. And if you want to measure this with subhertz accuracy, that means you need to interrogate this clock transition with 10 to the minus 15 accuracy, which is very difficult. However, if you prepare an entangled superposition of one isotope being in the S and the other isotope being <coughs> in the D and vice versa, you'll notice that this superposition is it in the decoherence-free subspace because all its magnetic moments and particle moments are almost identical, so magnetic field noise would not affect the superposition at all. In fact, the laser phase noise would not affect the superposition at all, but the superposition would evolve at the frequency difference between these two states, which is the isotope shift exactly, and the isotope shift only. So if you like, this is synthetic RF atomic clock with the radio frequency, transition frequency, which equals the isotope shift. So this is the experiment we, um, we performed. We trapped a two-ion crystal, surrounding 88 and surrounding 86, using sideband transitions, so a blue sideband and red sideband transition, prepared this entangled superposition, and measured the, the rate at which the superposition phase evolves as a function of time. In fact, you don't need to entangle the ions in order to do that. Similar to the experiment I, I've shown before, it's enough to apply two carrier pi over two pulse pulses and look at the, at the correlation spectroscopy ions, the price you pay is a little bit less contrast than your signal. So by performing this measurement, uh, we were able to measure the isotope shift between these two isotopes with about uh, 9 millihertz uh, uncertainty, uh, statistical and systematic being on par. Uh, that corresponds to a fractional frequency uncertainty of the isotope shift at 10 to the minus 11 which corresponds to an uncertainty on the full optical transition of about 10 to the minus 17. One thing we did not expect but did notice is that the isotope shift actually depended on both on the magnetic field and the M level that we used in the ground and excited state. And the reason for that is that the magnetic susceptibility of the D level does depend on the isotope that we use. Actually, it's a small effect. It's two parts in 10 to the minus 8, but it's very, it's very clear. And you can see here the frequency difference between these two superposition parts is a function of B times M. Okay, so uh, with that I would like to conclude uh, and thank all the hardworking uh, students and, and um, collaborators at the Trap Iron Group. Thank our funding agencies and you for your Thank you very much, Tori. Yeah. So really with the with the multi-ion clock, um, you, you talked about Zeeman shifts and quadrupole shifts. You can also um, cancel those by averaging by appropriate averaging over M sublevels, right? Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you if you can keep track of each ion by itself and average over M sublevels ion by ion. Uh, do you get to use the whole chain? Is that another way to to eliminate those systematics? For sure. Um, with one, so one disadvantage you'll have is the fact that your laser, unless you have individual addressing, your laser frequency would be different. You know, as, uh, your detuning would be different to each and every ion. 
that could lead eventually maybe a little bit to, to imperfect hypothesis. And I think that's a small overhead. The main overhead, in my opinion, is if you look at noises that could come up uh, with, these, um, with, these, with these parameters, then when you know these things coherently, you do it much faster, which means you're robust. You're more, in terms of the spectrum of noises you're able to deal with, it's much larger than the spectrum of noises you're, you're able to deal with when you try to measure each ion separately and then average over different different networks. But you're right. I mean, if you do this without, you could average these errors out incoherently. You don't necessarily have to average them out coherently. This is coherent average. So you, you had a nice linear plot there. Does that put any limits on interesting new physics? New, new physics? So what we did, Vladan <coughs> would tell you about what they did. We, we, in order to place limits on new physics, what you need to do is to be able to plot, uh, to perform a king plot comparison. So a comparison of two isotope shifts. Oh, so two transitions across an isotope chain. What does it mean? It means you need to spectroscopically investigate two transitions. Okay, that's a little bit of work. But you also need at least four isotopes in order to get three isotope shift comparisons. Right? The three isotope shifts correspond to four isotopes. And all these isotopes need to have zero nuclear spin because the hyperfine interaction would complicate this simple uh, approximation, I think, significantly. And that means you need to use an atom that has four bosonic isotopes. Uh, strontium plus, which is what we've been working for, unfortunately doesn't have stable four bosonic isotopes, and that's why we didn't do the full measurement uh, yet. Vladan used deuterium plus, which has many uh, stable uh, bosonic isotopes. Uh, Nico used calcium plus, which also has several uh, bosonic isotopes. Time for one more question. How far could I push your method? You are now at 10 millihertz or something. Can I do 1 millihertz? Can I do microhertz? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, both in terms of statistics. So if you look at the, at the uncertainty here, so the statistical uncertainty in our case was uh, 5 millihertz. The systematic uncertainty was 7 millihertz. Statistical uncertainty was simply due to our lack of patience. That was after about 24 hours of averaging. You know, you could, you could just wait longer and, and push that down. Uh, maybe 12 hours, it's less than 24. The seven um, millihertz systematic uncertainty was dominated by electric field gradient, uh, magnetic field gradients that were perpendicular to the twine crystal. What that happened was that um, any micromotion, any stray electric fields, when it pushes the ions away from the null of the RF, because the mass is a little bit different, they see a little bit of difference in the pseudo-potential, which means that the trap, the, the two-ion crystal tilts a little bit. And when it tilts, and if there is a magnetic field gradient perpendicular to your crystal, you get a little bit of a shift. So if you would, to repeat this measurement again, would get rid of magnetic field gradients perpendicular to the crystal as well. We didn't think of it ahead of time. You can certainly do better. So here there's no there's no decoupling. This is an entangled superposition. What we did in order to get a magnetic field gradient along the axial direction of the two ion crystal is to take data when the two ions are in, in inter, interleave data when the two ions flip their positions. That however did not get rid of of magnetic field, the effect of magnetic field gradients which were perpendicular to the time. It took us about six months to figure that out. <laughs> okay, so thanks okay. again. Thank you.